This morning, we're gonna start our series in the book of Hebrews. Now, we were doing a series on the journey of faith, and we've already talked about Psalm 84. Pastor Tom shared his journey of faith story with you and encourage you to get out of the boat and to walk with Jesus. This morning, as we get ready to begin the actual book of Hebrews, I wanna start with a movie clip. And it's a clip from the movie 42. That came out, I think, about a year ago. It's the Jackie Robinson story. And the piece, the clip that I've selected for us is a scene where Jackie Robinson is getting on a train, getting ready to leave to go off on the journey of faith that he's on in some ways, uh, to go play baseball in the major leagues. And there's some young African-American boys who are seeing him off at the train station and cheering him on. And I want you to watch this clip and then we're going to talk about it. Now the scene has really very little to do with the details of Jackie Robinson's life. They're not about him being a baseball player or any of those kinds of things. But the reason why the director included that scene and others in the movie is to try to make the point that Jackie Robinson was never playing baseball just for himself. That the journey he was on was not just about himself and that these young African-American kids, the reason why they're cheering Jackie Robinson on, the reason why they want him to succeed is because his story is their story. His journey is their journey. His success is their success. And the director's wanting us to get the point that Jackie Robinson's story was about so much more than one person playing baseball. And in fact, at the end, you know how at the end when they have these true story movies, they often have these screenshots and they show you what the major characters are up to uh, or what happened to them after the movie ended? <clears throat> well, in, in, in addition to the major characters of the movie, uh, the director also shows a screenshot of the last little boy that you saw, and he's supposed to represent a guy named Ed Charles, who's a real life person, who went on to play Major League Baseball. He played for the 1969 uh, Mets and won a World Series. And the point's supposed to be, in addition to Jackie Robinson and his wife and Branch Rickey and all of the other major characters, African American children are major character. And the reason they're a major character is that his story is their story. And then in many ways, Ed Charles is cheering on Jackie Robinson because what Jackie Robinson is going to do matters for him. And then if Jackie Robinson succeeds, Ed Charles succeeds. That their stories are united together. Well, this morning we're beginning our look at the book of Hebrews. And I told you the book of Hebrews is about two stories or two journeys. Jesus' journey and our journey. And the point is, is an even greater way than Jackie Robinson's story represents uh, the story of African Americans everywhere, and in fact, Americans everywhere. In an even greater way, Jesus' story is our story. And Jesus' journey is our journey. And Jesus' success is our success. And so the author of the book of Hebrews begins by telling us Jesus' story. And this morning we want to look at the story of Jesus, the journey that Jesus went on. Because his story is our story. His journey is our journey. His success is our success. So take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 is page 967 in the Bibles that the church provides. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now stop there for a moment. Interestingly enough, this is a letter to the Hebrews, but it doesn't really start with any form of introduction. 
There's no uh, mention of author, there's no mention of recipients, there's no mention of desti destination or reason for writing. The author of the book of Hebrews simply jumps right in, both feet, into the story of Jesus. He wants to tell us that in the past, in the Old Testament, God spoke at various times and in different ways through the prophets, and that was great. But the problem was you never knew when a prophet was going to show up. You never knew what the prophet was going to say. And people living in Old Testament times had to try to piece together kind of the whole big picture from these various prophets and they didn't have the whole thing. But the author of Hebrews is saying is the good news for you and I now who live today, we have the whole story that God wants to tell us in the person of Jesus. That everything that you and I need to know about life is told to us in the story of Jesus. And as we observe the story of Jesus, as we understand the story of Jesus, as we listen to what God says about the story of Jesus, everything we need to know for our journeys of faith is talked about in his journey of faith. And everything we need to know for our story, God has fully and completely revealed to us in Jesus' story. We don't have to try to piece this thing together. We don't have to wonder, is some prophet going to show up and give us another piece? In the person of Jesus, God tells us the whole thing all at once. Now, there are certain aspects of Jesus' story that God might highlight in our lives at a particular time. There's certain things about Jesus and what he went through and how he handled that that God may use in our lives in new and fresh ways so that we can talk about God speaking to us in new and fresh ways. But the good news is, is everything you need to know about your journey of faith has already been said in Jesus' journey of faith. And so the good news here is we're all on journeys. We're all on journeys. God's asking us to leave where we are and to come follow him. And if you're on a journey of faith with regard to adoption, everything you need to know about that journey has already been said by God in Jesus' journey. If you're on a journey of faith in a difficult situation at work, perhaps you're staring unemployment in the face, whatever, everything you need to know about that journey, God has already said in the story of Jesus. If you're going through a situation where it's a difficult assignment that God's asked you to do, uh, to go on a missions trip, or God's asked you to be in charge of a small group, or God's asked you to confront somebody that you don't want to have to confront, whatever it is, that journey of faith, everything you need to know about that journey, God has already said in Jesus' journey. For us as a church, as we think about this building project and where might God want us to go, everything we need to know, everything about that journey, God has already said in the story of Jesus. And so what the author of Hebrews is doing is before he really gets to talking specifically about our stories, he starts with the story of Jesus. Because the better we understand Jesus' story, the better we understand our story. Just like Jackie Robinson represents for those African-American boys their hope, their future, their success, Jesus represents for us our story. His journey is our journey. And so the author of Hebrews is going to take the first two chapters of the book of Hebrews especially and really talk about the story of Jesus. Now he's going to do so in some terminology that's, that's maybe a little bit strange to us or maybe a little bit unknown to us. And so what I want to do is I want to tell you the story of Jesus kind of the way the author of Hebrews does in the first two chapters. I want to kind of overview that for you because that's what the author of Hebrews does at the beginning in the first few verses. He gives us an overview of the story. So let me share it with you. And I'm a visual learner, and you may be a visual learner too. So let me show you a graphic that might help explain what the author of Hebrews is trying to do. Now, the author of Hebrews, in, he tell, in telling Jesus' story, uses three categories of beings, God, angels, and humans. And I've put them up here in this uh, graphic in order of decreasing glory. So God is the most glorious, and then angels, and then humans. And at the beginning of Jesus' story, he is in the category of God, meaning that Jesus is God. He is fully God. He is completely God. And the beginning of his story, Jesus is reigning and ruling as God and with God. 
The first part of Jesus' story is his descent into becoming a human. And the reason why we've got angels up here is that the author of Hebrews uses the angels as sort of a baseline to kind of evaluate. At the beginning, Jesus is above the angels. But according to Hebrews chapter 2, he was made a little lower than the angels, meaning he descended beneath the angels in glory to become one of us, to become a human, to die for us. It says in Hebrews 2, he became a human so that he might taste death for us. In other words, he might die for us. But the point is, is he went through that descent so that he could come get us. Because we're stuck in the category of humans. We're stuck at that level. And so Jesus became one of us, Hebrews 2 tells us, so that we might be part of his family. That's the first half of Jesus' story. The second half of Jesus' story is Jesus' ascent back to the place and the glory that he had before. That Jesus was for a time made a little lower than the angels, but that's not where he is now. Now he is reigning again with God back in the place of full glory, divine. Now he never stopped being God, but he became human and now has been exalted again. But the point of this is not just to tell a story about Jesus. The point for the author of Hebrews is, is that Jesus not only ascends back to the place he was before, the good news is he takes us with him. That those who are believers in Jesus are now, now this is crazy, I know this. We are now at the level of God. Now that may seem a little weird to see us listed not just with humans, but with God. But remember in Second Peter, because of Jesus' work, we are now partakers of the divine nature that through Jesus we are now allowed to have fellowship with God, that we are being conformed to the image of Christ, that we are becoming like God. This is all possible because Jesus' story is our story. He comes to get us and he lifts us higher. We start out below the angels and we end up above them in glory and in honor. And this is the story of Jesus. Now the author of Hebrews does very, something very interesting with this story. Is he tells it in two parts, but he reverses them. Meaning he starts with the second half. Jesus' reascent to a place of glory. That's chapter one. Chapter two, he goes back to the first part of the story, which is Jesus' descent. Next week we're going to look at the descent of Jesus. But this week we're talking about the, the lifting up or the exaltation. That's why Andy said at the beginning of the service, we're going to sing in the hallelujah chorus to start off. Because what the author of Hebrews does is he talks about Jesus reigning in glory with God, meaning he tells us the end of the story first. And so this morning, because Jesus' story is our story, the author of Hebrews wants us to understand four things about Jesus' journey that will help us in our journeys. From this second half of Jesus' journey, the fact that he is being exalted and has been exalted to the place of God. Four things that we can learn about our story from Jesus and his story. And that's what the rest of chapter one is about. So look with me at verses five through seven. This is the first thing that you and I can learn on our journeys of faith from Jesus and his journey of faith. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. The first thing we learn from the story of Jesus is that as we walk our journeys of faith, as we follow Jesus, we do so as sons and daughters of God. Meaning that God is our Father. 
Now that's not true, Hebrews is saying, of angels. Angels are simply ministering spirits. They're servants of God. It's not true that they relate to God as father to son. But that is true for Jesus. See, Jesus is God's son at the beginning of the story. He is God's son from eternity past. His relationship to God is that of son to father. But the author of Hebrews is saying is when he became a human, that where he has been exalted back to is a place of sonship. Today I have become your father. And that even though Jesus has been the son for all of eternity, that today he is uniquely declared to be the son of God. And the purpose for this statement is for us to realize that what is now true of him is also true of us. That as we go on our journeys of faith, we are journeying with a father who's guiding us. God is not a father to everyone. God is not a father to angels. God is a father to those who are following his son by faith because when we follow his son and his son's story, it becomes our story. And the point is, is whatever journey you're on, if you're going through a, a difficult season of life, if you're going through a problem in your marriage, if you're going through a problem at work, if you're walking on your journey of faith, the thing you need to know from Jesus' story is you are walking on that journey as a son or daughter of God. And that God is going to guide you on that journey with love, with grace, with mercy, with forgiveness. That at times on your journey when you want to quit, at times when you're afraid, when you can't go any further, it's your Father in heaven who picks you up and he holds you and he hugs you and he loves you and he says, come with me, take my hand, don't be afraid. The thing we learn from Jesus' story is Jesus did not go through his journey as a servant, he went through it as the son. And that's what he's won for us. Is that you and I, walk through our Christian lives, not as servants, not like the angels, but as children of God. Amen. Second thing we learn for our story, from looking at Jesus' story, verses eight and nine. But about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. The second thing we learn about our journeys from watching Jesus' journey, God rewards those who love righteousness. God rewards those who love righteousness. When we look at where Jesus is now, he is filled with joy. He's reigning over an eternal kingdom. He has inherited from God all things. And God tells us he's there because he loved righteousness. Not because he loved prestige. Not because he loved power. Not because he loved popularity. Not because he loved money. Not because he loved comfort. It's because he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. If you're here and you're a, a student at school and you're experiencing cyberbullying and you're being picked on online and it's a very difficult situation but you've decided because God says do not seek revenge that you're not going to seek revenge, that you're not going to try to get those people back, you're following the path of Jesus and what you need to know is God rewards that love of righteousness. If you're being persecuted for your faith, if you're being picked on for being a Christian, but you choose to follow Jesus' path and not retaliate, you choose to follow Jesus' path and bless those who curse you and do good to those who are doing evil to you, the point is, is God rewards those who love. Look at Jesus. Jesus didn't kind of go through life and think, I'm gonna live my life for myself and then at the end I'm gonna try to fix it and make it right with God. That's not what he did. He lived his life loving righteousness and hating wickedness. 
Now look, I love the language. It's loving righteousness. It doesn't say God rewards everybody who always does what's right. Now Jesus always did what was right. And our righteousness comes from him. But the point is, if you love righteousness, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. When we hunger and thirst for money or for power or for sex or for glory or for comfort or for whatever it is, that's not Jesus' story. Jesus' story, if you long for righteousness, if you hunger to do what's right, that's what God rewards. And Jesus has an eternal kingdom because he loved righteousness. And those who love righteousness and hate wickedness experience the same joy that Jesus does. Third thing we learn from Jesus' story for our stories of faith. Verses 10 through 12. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. We learn from Jesus that the end of our journey, if we're following Jesus, is eternal life. The end of our journey is eternal life. Now it's easy to look at Jesus and go, of course, he's got eternal life, he's God. That's not the author of Hebrews point. Jesus became a human. And as a human, his destiny is not death, but life. Years that will never end. Everything in this world that you see, will someday disappear. But Jesus, he will last forever and ever and ever. And those who follow Jesus, that's our fate. Our fate is humans who live forever, eternal life. And when we look at Jesus, we see a human who will never die, who will live forever and ever and ever. And the end of his story is the end of our story. And what Jesus has won for us by dying on a cross in our place is eternal life. Years that will never, ever end. Fourth, verse 13. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The fourth thing we learn for our journeys from looking at Jesus' journey is that right now in heaven, Jesus is waiting. He's waiting at God's right hand for God to restore all things. And the promise for you and I is we're waiting too. But what's coming is restoration. What's coming is vindication. What's coming is fulfillment. What I mean by that is Jesus submitted to his enemies. His enemies who crucified him on a cross. He submitted to them even though he was innocent, even though he could have fought. He had a hard, difficult life and a hellish death. But God's going to make it all right. God will restore all things. That Jesus is now, according to Hebrews 1, the inheritor of all things. That God has made it up to him. He has given to Jesus all things. And the point is, for you and I, our future, if we follow Jesus, is that God will fix everything. That God will restore everything. If you're here today and you've been asked by God to walk on the journey of infertility and you think to yourself, how is this fair? I hear this all the time from Christians. How is it fair that I have to be infertile? How is it fair that I was abused as a child? I didn't do anything wrong. That's absolutely correct. It's not fair. How is it fair that the missionaries I went to visit, they have a hard life, you know that? 
It's a hard life. Why do they get that life and I get this life? How is that fair? How is it fair that you lost a child to death? How is it fair that your spouse cheated on you or was unfaithful? How is it fair that God asked you to go through life uh, having lost a spouse at a young age? How is it fair that you've been diagnosed with this difficult health situation and nobody else is? How is that fair? The answer is it's not. But God will make it right. Not just he will make it go away, he will make it up to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's this great verse in Joel after Israel goes through this plague of locusts and God says to Israel, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Not just we'll get through this Israel, we'll make it and we'll press forward. No, I'm gonna give you back everything you lost and more. That's the promise for those who follow Jesus. Jesus has gotten back and will get back everything he lost plus a billion things more. Us. All of the glory and honor. Anything Jesus suffered, God will make up to him. That's the promise. The end of our story, if you've been asked to walk a life of singleness and you think, how is this fair? It's not fair. But God says, I promise you, I swear to you on my life, I will make it up to you. I will make it better. I will make it so you have so much. I will give you so much. And when you look at Jesus' story, and we look at our own lives, and we say, but it's not fair. God says, but you haven't seen the end of your story yet. You haven't seen what it's going to be like in heaven. You haven't seen how I'm going to make up all the suffering you've been through all the persecution, all the sacrifice, everything you've gone through, all the physical struggles you've had here on earth, whatever it is. God says, look at Jesus. Look at his story. Do you see how it ends? Yes, he suffered an incredible injustice. He was crucified in the worst possible death. He was rejected by everyone. He was alone. But look where he is now. The descent part is not the end of the story. And so the author of Hebrews says, look, let's not talk about the tough stuff. There is tough stuff. We're going to talk about it next week. Let's talk about how the story ends. And the story ends well. Because God restores all things. And if you take nothing else from the first chapter of Hebrews, nothing else from this entire series, I want you to hear one thing. It ends well. Whatever journey you're on, whatever you're going through, it ends well. That's why I showed that clip from the movie 42, the Jackie Robinson story, is because when you watch that movie, you already know he ends up in the Hall of Fame. You already know he breaks the color barrier. You already know that he ends up being a fabulous Major League Baseball player. You already know that he's honored by baseball. I think today the number 42 is the one number retired by every team in baseball in honor of Jackie Robinson. Nobody else in the history of baseball has been honored the way Jackie Robinson has been honored. You already know that story so that when you come to see the horrendous racism in the movie, when you come to see the incredible hatred and you think, how can we do this to each other? When you watch this, you watch it with the end in mind. You know the story ends well. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying. Look, he's not going to sugarcoat the fact that when we walk through the valley of Baca, when we walk through the valley of dryness, the valley of difficulty, that it's hard. But he starts with the end. Keep the end in mind. And the promise of God to you is your story ends well. Your story ends well. Whatever health thing you're going through, whatever difficulty you're going through in your life, whatever problems you're having in your marriage, whatever's happening to you physically or relationally or emotionally or spiritually, whatever it is, if you follow Jesus, your story ends well. Because Jesus' story is our story. His journey is our journey. His success is our success. And today, Jesus is relating to God, Father to Son. Jesus has inherited an eternal kingdom. Jesus has been given eternal life. Jesus has inherited all things and all the pain he's been through has been made up to him. And the point is that's our future too. So I don't know what the details are going to be in your life. I don't know what they're going to be in my life. 
But I know this, it ends well. The little journey you're on and the bigger journey you're on. You say, but I can't see it. I can't see it either. That's why Hebrews is going to talk about faith. Because faith is the ability to see things that are there that we can't see. But the author of Hebrews starts with the end in mind. Look at Jesus. Look where he's at. Look what God has done for him. Next week, we're going to talk about the descent. We're going to talk about the pain. We're going to talk about the... De- but this week, look where he is. That's why we sing the hallelujah chorus is because he is seated on that throne. All things are being restored for him. That's our future. It ends well. If you're a follower of Jesus, whatever you're thinking about right now, whatever situation you're walking through, it ends well. I don't know how, but the promise of God is it will end well well trust in his unfailing love let's pray together Lord God there are many here right now who perhaps the word infertility or adultery or singleness uh, Lord God perhaps the mention of death or loss or health has sparked within them great fear Great anxiety. Maybe you brought them here this morning, uh, Lord God, because they're in the midst of something difficult. Lord, would you speak to them and tell them it ends well? God, I can tell them all I want, but when you say it, they're going to believe it. God, would you help us to take our eyes off our circumstances and help us to fix them on Jesus? Lord, I thank you that his story is already done. We already know how it ends. And I thank you that Jesus, that you came and you broke the barrier for us. That you opened the pathway. That you gave us the right to experience God's love as father to son or father to daughter. That you have won for us an eternal kingdom. That you've won for us eternal life. And that you have won for us the restoration of all things. God, I pray for those here who are longing to see a loved one who are suffering through incredible physical difficulties, who have suffered abuse or the ravages of sin. God, help them to see that, Jesus, you went through all of that and now look where you are. And God, I pray that we might have the eyes to believe that it will end well. Thank you, Lord, for starting at the end. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.